In studio today, Bird is joined by Queen's counsel and legendary criminal defense lawyer, John Conroy. In historic cases before the Supreme Court of Canada, Conroy has defended the rights of patients using medical cannabis and fought for the constitutionality of accessible medication at an affordable price. With decisions such as Smith & Allard, the landscape of medical marijuana, compassion clubs, medical treatment with cannabis, and the rights of the person as underlined by the Charter have been profoundly changed for the better. Now in the latter years of his practice, Conroy sits down with Burt to reflect on what needs to change going forward and how our current cannabis legalization has largely forgotten medical patients for whom much of legalization was purported to be for. We go now to Burt in conversation. Good afternoon. Welcome to License to Chill. I got a really special guest today, John Conroy, who's a legend in the cannabis industry. Um, you are at the forefront of this industry. You're very much involved, and I, I don't know if we've got enough, to, enough time this afternoon in one session to cover everything I want to cover off with you. But welcome to License to Chill. Thank you. I very much appreciate you making the time to come in from Abbotsford to this, con to, uh, this and then I understand you're going on to a conference. Right. But I want to start off with a breaking news that I found really interesting is that um, – Two days ago, um, a, a dispensary was raided in Vancouver on Thurlow Street, um, and owned by Dana Larson. And I understand the cannabis cops came in, cleaned out all the product out of the establishment of the dispensary, and then uh, a few hours later, they were back in business. What's your take on what the government's doing by doing those raids, coming into an, uh, an establishment, a place that's been there for decades, uh, because I know this place, it's on Thurlow Street and uh, by Davy, and uh, they go in, they take the product, but yet they're back in business and they keep on going. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the official uh, version, as I understand it, is that they were all warned that uh, this was going to happen, that they'd all come and been visited before, and that they're doing it basically for the benefit of those that have already got their licenses, so to prevent them from competing with those who are already licensed, even though, as I understand it, Dana has applied for a rec license, and that was in the process. I thought originally they were holding off on those who were in the process. That was our understanding in terms of the whole injunction and everything. So, you know, um, I can understand it if it's one of the new ones that has just come up and is, you know, just becoming involved. But Dana, as you say, his operation has been there for a long, long time and caters to the medicinal market. And that's significant. But at the same time, he's decided to apply for the recreational license there and not medical. Yeah. And so that's a big issue that I'm grappling with because I incorporated the BC Compassion Club Society back in 1997, so more than 20 years ago. They have just applied. They had visits from the community safety team too. But, you know, they've been, uh, they, the Senate went through, Senator Nolan, the task force went through. If you look into the history of the BC Compassion Club, you've got rave reviews from all these yeah. inquiries about this model. Now, it's a special model. It's not a storefront medical dispensary. It's a not-for-profit compassion club. So people become members, patients. Their medical stuff is on file. Um, they've verified there's a real doctor who's approved them and then people come there and they can purchase the cannabis uh, at the club and they can sit and talk to other patients and learn in terms of you know their experiences and so on so that's the compassion club so they've applied people have to remember the feds uh, even though we thought this was a dividing health powers between the feds and the provinces, the feds say, no, 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 this is still criminal law. We have allowed the provinces to do this distribution in the rec market. Uh, but, you know, if you look at the overall Cannabis Act and regulations, uh, while you've got a little bit of legalization in terms of your four plants and your 30 grams when you're out and about, uh, and you've got a little bit of decriminalization with the uh, ticketing scheme. If you're a bit over your number of plants or what you're possessing, you can get up to a $200 fine for the, uh, your ticket. But if you're over that, it's still criminal law. Now, it's, it's lesser criminal law maybe than before in that, you know, trafficking, possession for the purpose of trafficking, 
used to be a maximum life sentence. Yeah. Um, and so now it's, it, and it was on, only by indictment, which maybe people don't understand, is like a felony as opposed to a misdemeanor, whereas a summary conviction offense is like misdemeanor. So now they've all been what we call hybridized, indictable and, and summary. So there are the lesser penalties for distributing, selling, so on and so forth. So people complain about many more offenses, but they're actually, you know, my view is, is a lot of it, it's politics, smoke and mirrors. We wanted the right wing to believe that we're still getting tough to, you know, restrict access by kids and so yeah. on and protect children. Um, and so they did this, uh, saying we're still going to have these penalties. I mean, the 14-year max is totally ridiculous because it has other ramifications yeah. in sentencing in the criminal justice system. You can't get house arrest if the penalty is 14 years and up, stuff like that. But but nobody, uh, very few people have been busted. I, 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 don't, I haven't heard of anybody being busted on indictment so far since last year. No, I so, I mean... We are moving in the right direction, but there are still all these issues. And to come back to what we were talking about, the medical is controlled by the feds. They have not, uh, so you look at the provincial legislation, it expressly says it doesn't apply to medical cannabis. And, but part 14 of the cannabis regulations is the old access to cannabis for medical purposes that came about as a result of the, the court case. and. That is the current system. Now, they've said they'll review it after five years. But again, all it does is it allows you to grow for yourself. And of course, your number of plants and so on depends on your dosage. And as a medical patient, you could possess up to 150 grams, depending on your dosage, in addition to the anything in the rec market. But so you can grow for yourself, have a designated grower for you if that person can pass the, the record, criminal record checks and all that stuff. Or you can get it from an LP, a licensed producer. And that is, you go to your doctor, if your doctor approves you, he can register you immediately with that LP, who can either send it to the doctor, send it to you, uh, or send it to a named individual responsible for you. And so, we are looking at the legislation that doesn't provide for medical dispensaries that are limited to solely dealing with medical issues. And we're saying, okay, the license to sell for medical is still a federal license. It's a subset of the regular license to sell. So the club is applying for a license to sell for medical purposes. Shoppers Drug Mart has a non-possession yeah. type license where you register with them and the LP sends it to you. This is a possession license. So it's the, it's the society that will be ordering the, the product from the licensed producers that will hopefully include craft producers that we need to talk about. And uh, so that, uh, the patients will be able to go to the club, uh, either having ordered online from elsewhere or order yep. online right at the club. The product will be sent, bought by the club and sent to the club, and the patients will be able to come to the club very close to the existing situation. And so, but that's a nonprofit, yeah. you know, no advertising, no trying to bring people in. It's a closed economy type of situation. But, you know, the feds, I mean, just... Judge Phelan in the Allard case, you know, it was all about the conservatives trying to take away your right to grow or have somebody grow for you and to put in solely this licensed producer system. And the court found that the licensed producer system was unconstitutional. It wasn't sufficient to provide reasonable access and said that the heart of access are the dispensaries. Okay. And so, you know, we suddenly had this huge number of dispensaries in Vancouver compared to the few we had with the Compassion Club. And that then led uh, to further developments. Uh, I think wisely in BC, uh, use of the civil process, so injunctions and things like that, as opposed to Toronto, where it was busting people again and, and charging them and, you know, filling up the criminal courts again with all the people who were helping in the dispensaries. A, a complete huge cost and a complete waste of, of time, Not really. Money. So, so, you know, it's a tough situation what's going on now. I say to all those who are d dealing with medical, well, if they've been, you know, if they're losing their access because of what's happened, remember the BC Club is still there yeah. and that you can still get it from an LP even if it's temporary. And, and unfortunately, the reputation of the product 
on the LPs uh, out there in the community, with odd exception, is not great. And we know that the the, the underground market uh, is thriving, uh, and it's thriving because of uh, the ineptitude of the government <laughs> to deal with this properly. I mean, I, you know, you bump into local government people, and they're the ones who are dealing with zoning and licensing and this sort of stuff. And they're all, uh, it's like Prohibition 2.0 or something. They're all, oh, we need to wait and see what's happening. And, and uh, you know, you say to them, well, you've got cigarette vending machines at every gas station and so on, and tobacco kills. What's the problem? you got, uh, in Mission, we've got a liquor store across from the school that's called the City Hall Liquor Store, you know. So you've got all these things happening with booze. And then we've had all of these dispensaries. The Compassion Club's been there since 97, and they all rave about it when they investigate yeah. it. All the other dispensaries are there. What were the problems? Yeah. We didn't have kids trying to go in and smash the glass to get at those colorful gummies, did we? No. You know, no. which they all go on about all the time. The biggest problem that way is parents, negligent parents who leave it lying around on their coffee table or something and the kid or the dog gets into it, that's what causes the problem. <laughs> that's right. you know? But oh, we've got to have all these laws and rules and regulations because they treat it like plutonium. Exactly. You know? that's it's not exactly the plutonium. Word I use. That's the word I've been using all the time. <laughs> So uh, you shake your head and you say, you know, what further guidance do you need from the federal government? They've said, here, province, you can legislate for distribution. The province has come up with its legislation. Why, are, you know, why has Alberta got more dispensaries than British Columbia? British Columbia was the cocoon throughout all of these years uh, in terms of the cannabis thing. And we have all of these you know, local governments doing this, oh, we have to worry, wait and see, and so on. Oh, now, I mean, history is repeating itself a little bit because we did have, I think, Sumas was wet and Matsqui was dry, which are the yeah. areas out around Abbotsford. So, I mean, history is repeating itself to, to some extent. But, you know, it, 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 it's this weird stigma and fear that's still there uh, despite all of the the modern evidence, I mean, we know more about cannabis in the last 50 years than you know, in the last 10 years even. We've learned huge amounts more than what we used to know. So yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's troubling that we're still doing it. I mean, you know, a good example of, of the government's, you know, why did they decide to delay extracts, edibles, and topicals for a year? Was it because they wanted the underground to have a, a one last year to, to do well uh, before they uh, <laughs> limited them to 10 milligrams? Was that really what was it all about? I mean, you know, they should have been doing that. was the first thing they should have been regulating. Absolutely. Particularly since but then what do they do? Maximum 10 milligrams of THC per discrete yeah. unit. Yeah. So Sean Davey, now... Admittedly, he doesn't just use edibles or extracts, but he was a 25 gram a day person who will start maybe the smoke in the morning, and but he'll juice and he'll do all the different things and use up his 25 grams a day. I mean, I've heard of people recently with 100 and 200 gram a day licenses that mostly just juice and nothing else. So you've got these big licenses. So what, let's use Sean as an example at a 20, or anybody who has a 25 gram a day license. If the product, the discrete unit, is limited to 10 milligrams of THC, he would have to buy 2,500 units each day uh, with all the plastic and the cardboard and all the other problems that go with it. You know, what's he going to? If it's an edible, I don't know how much sugar yeah. is in the product. I mean, it, it just doesn't make any. It, it makes sense to have a 10 milligram THC product for the novice users and so on and, and available for people. But it doesn't make sense to say anything over that's prohibited, especially when we know that there are medical patients who, as a result of Smith, remember the government tried to limit it to dried product only, and that went to court and all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada before you know, the Supreme Court of Canada said, that's ridiculous, it's unreasonable, and made it immediately take effect their decision. In, in many constitutional cases, like 
when we won in Allard, the government was given six months to fix things up. In Smith, the government said, you've got no time to fix it up. It's immediately available to patients. But, so patients can possess in any form, but they have to make it themselves or have somebody yeah. make it for them because they can't go to a store and buy it. So now you've got all these folks who are in the rec market can go to stores and buy all kinds of things. But a medical patient who they are required to provide reasonable access, why? To prevent the violation of their constitutional rights to the security of their person. Yeah. There's no constitutional rights involved in the rec market. So we've got all these things going on for the rec market, but not remembering the basic beginnings with the medical market and how their constitutional rights are involved. So I think the government has, has not done well at all in terms of the medical market. And, uh, you know, they don't seem to appreciate the distinction between uh, medical and, and rec. They, yeah. they think, you know, go into a store where there's a thousand different uh, products, maybe all labeled and stuff. I mean, you know, that, they don't get it. The medical guys have been going to these clubs and so on, trying to find strains that work for them. We know that your tolerance develops as you consume cannabis, and so often they switch to other strains and so on in order to deal with that. Uh, we know that you know, they, they're looking for strains that work for either chronic pain or specific things, uh, and often they've taken quite a while in order to find a, a craft grower that's doing it. Yeah. So, you know, that takes us, I suppose, to leads into another thing, the, the craft grower issue. I mean, yeah. up in the Kootenays, yeah. they've got 2,000 craft growers that we've got to transition into the, the system. Into and they've the even got market. government funding to help them uh, do it. Yeah. Um, these are the people who have been producing quality product over a long period of time. And, uh, you know, if you're growing in your basement, growing as a DG or for yourself, or uh, maybe in your barn or an outbuilding, uh, you don't want the government to come in and uh, turn it into a micro-production facility. You know, you, you don't have to have all of the security and all of the stuff that the standard and, and other LPs have to have as a designated grower. I mean, you, you, there's some you certainly have to have, but nowhere near the, that level. And, and you, you don't want to have the micro-production in your basement or maybe in your outbuilding anyway. So we do have people who are putting together made-to-measure uh, micro units in industrial parks yeah. so that you can make your application and say to Health Canada, here's my building, all made-to-measure based on your things. The city's approved it. Uh, I know Castlegar up is hoping in, uh, to have things like this move forward. There's a number of companies that are into doing that. There's others that are doing uh, container units, the metal uh, reefer units in particular, uh, so there are made-to-measure micro container units. I know uh, Delta 9 uh, produces them. I believe there's many others that are producing them. They bring them in, set them down. There's issues about agricultural land reserve because, uh, at least here in B.C., recently the uh, ALR, uh, Agricultural Land Commission, ALC, decided to basically delegate everything to the local governments so that they wouldn't have to be involved in deciding things to do with cannabis anymore. Now, they have at least said any production of cannabis in any form is farm use. So that's good. You're back, to, you know, you're in a farm zone if you're, yeah. there's no zoning issue. But they've said no more buildings. You can't build, you can only grow in soil uh, since July of 2018, I think right. it was. You can't, yeah, you can't contaminate the, so the ground in an ALR. by putting down uh, concrete. You have to be on natural earth. Unless you had started something before. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, you know, it's expensive. Uh, and in greenhouses, you know, maybe that works good up in the Kootenays or something, but I'm not so sure if you're down here at the lower mainland that... Uh, you can grow a good product from the beginning to end uh, through the greenhouse process. Yeah. Um, you know, there's certainly fancy new different types of greenhouses and so on. But I say, well, why can you put the, these units that aren't going into the soil on top of the soil, the, the reefer units, yeah. they're movable, 
you know, what's wrong with that? I mean, surely we want to encourage the small craft growers who are going to be out in the country and often maybe in ALR lands to be able to have a unit that is their micro unit yeah. as opposed to their DG unit or whatever. And or, or, or are they going to have to go into town to the industrial park, you know? I mean, it seems that we should be facilitating, I think, the growing of farm products, uh, not just in soil. Uh, I, I like the, the reduction in the concrete, in, especially in, in terms of farmland. But uh, it seems to me these units would be another alternative. But anyway, the big thing is we've got all these craft growers who are not moved in. You know, we've got the big licensed producers, and certainly we've got some folks from the early days that are in involved in the different licensed producers. But we still have, as I understand it, a large number of small craft growers who there's just no way they can afford or want to afford to spend all the money that uh, the government wants them to spend as far as becoming standard producers. So they introduced the micro. And some folks think that uh, it, it's almost designed to fail because of the cost and limits on size and so on. Some others think that they can, you know, do it. And so it's going to be interesting to see. But just suddenly providing for micro producers isn't enough. The, there's obviously a lot more that is going to have to be done to enable these folks to, to move in and, and start producing and having their product in the market. Mm -hmm. So, you know... There's that issue, the extract issue, the the Compassion Club uh, dispensary issue. Uh, those are all still big ongoing issues that need to be sorted out, uh, along with uh, simply you know getting these local governments and so on to overcome uh, you know this irrational fear that they have yeah. uh, when we've got 20 years at least of experience with dispensaries to show that. Uh, they're easily to man easy to manage. What's yeah. the problem? And the sky's not falling. The conversation with you is like going to an intersection where there are about 10 roads <laughs> leaving off from that intersection. You're not sure which one you want to go down first. <laughs> but I want to come back to the 10 milligram. Okay. I, to me, I equate 10 milligrams to drinking light beer. My background is liquor licensing, and I look upon the 10 milligram thing, that, that to me is like light beer. Yeah. Alcohol, we have all sorts of different levels of alcohol content in a product. Yeah. And to me, there should be that same thing. Where did the 10 milligram come from? Did somebody in Ottawa just think uh, this thing up over lunch uh, or I'm something? I'm not sure. I have heard, but I don't know what the source is, but I've heard from various people that... You know, that is a good micro dose or low dose for people if they're starting out and stuff like that. So, yeah. Uh, but in, in the United States, I understand that some jurisdictions have different levels. Yep. Um, if depending on whether it be a recre recreational user or a medical user, yeah, that's, like California. Yeah, that's what should be happening. And so you have a case before government right now, no, before the courts on we're, this we're, issue? We've been looking at it and, uh, you know, at one point thought we might start something before the change, but then decided maybe after the change. So we've got a number of, uh, of uh, people who have children in particular who need high-end extracts. And that's the Davy case, right? Uh, no. Cheryl Rose is her daughter. Haley oh, yeah. is one of them. Okay. Uh, there's, I think, two others, but more recently we've been in touch with Neil Magnuson in terms of what's going on with the opiate addicts, because mm -hmm. obviously you've got opiate addicts who are going to need more than 10 milligrams of THC in order to help get them off their opiates, uh, and so they're getting high-end concentrate extracts to help them get off their opiates. You know, at the Compassion Club, we knew that people were getting off heroin and stuff by coming to the Compassion Club years ago, but it was all anecdotal. We now have double-blind placebo-based studies that show that cannabis is a, a, a very good exit strategy drug from the opiates. We have the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in 2017 surveying all of the studies to do with cannabis and commenting about all the problems in terms of research because of the law but saying notwithstanding all those difficulties, there is conclusive evidence that cannabis is effective for chronic pain. The oxys and all the other opiates that the doctors have been prescribing is for chronic pain. And so what a lot of these folks in, that are you know, 
going to their doctors, being prescribed oxys for years, misled by Purdue Pharma into it not being as uh, in, you know addictive as as it turned out to be. Uh, doctors being scared of getting in trouble with the colleges or getting in trouble with the colleges and then cutting off the patients and them going to the street uh, and buying stuff on the street uh, that turns out to have fentanyl in it, uh, going home and dying at home, yeah. not in the alleyways anymore. Yeah. And so uh, we know that this is, uh, you know, beyond the street person. Uh, it's not uh, what we had in the old days that were mostly street people. Uh, it's ordinary folks that are dying from the opiate crisis. Yeah. And uh, we know that, uh, you know, if they, if they really move ahead on the extracts and stuff, that is something that, that could be used in order to help a significant number of people to use a drug that has no lethal dose in order to uh, deal with your chronic pain. And, and in fact, the, the, what I'm hearing is that if the doctors were able to initiate you on cannabis products without any opiates, that that will happen. We have evidence in the U.S. and places where cannabis is the states where it's been made legal, their opiate number crisis numbers are going down. So that's fascinating. Yeah, it, it's a, a major problem. And cannabis is a potential solution. Yeah. Um, no, I totally agree with you. Now, with respect to um, the uh, 10 milligram limit, um, do you see any movement in that area with the government? Or uh, to, well, to it's unreasonable. And <laughs> we, uh, you know, we probably have to go to court in order to get the court to say it's unreasonable, it's and then we'll then see. You know, but it, it their Health Canada is not responding at all. No, it doesn't seem to. I mean, we made all submissions, you know, when yeah. they were proposing the regulations, and they haven't changed them. Yeah. So, well, I've got to tell you, I have a friend. She has Crohn's disease, and today's Friday, and this morning she and her husband would have put $100 in an envelope on their barbecue, on their patio at their house, and tonight that $100 is going to be gone. Mm -hmm. It's going to be replaced with a bag of some stuff that's stronger than 10 milligrams that helps her with her Crohn's disease. Yeah. And that's the sort of stuff that's going on all over the place. Yeah. Now, I, I want to come back to the rollout. We're one year after. How do you feel the governments have done on the rollout of cannabis uh, in terms of Canada bringing it into legalization? What are your thoughts on it from a broad 30,000-foot um, uh, level? Well, you know, as I say, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, so it's good. I mean, we've had all these promises and promises year after year from all sorts of other politicians. And finally... Uh, we at least move forward, and as I say, I think a lot of the stuff is smoke and mirrors to pacify the the right wing, and that we aren't, you know, we are, despite what is still there in the legislation, 14-year maxes and stuff like that. Uh, I think you know we're heading in the right direction. Obviously, not as fast and as quick as I would like to see, and obviously, still all kinds of ridiculous, uh, unreasonable limits, uh, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of you know, the rollout, but uh, at least it's rolling out. At least it's moving forward. Um, there's lots we can do to make it better. So if you had a, again, if, local government, I think, is, is part of the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we categorize local governments as being like a traffic light, red, green, and yellow. Uh, those are green, like Vancouver, city of North Vancouver, uh, yellow, like Coquitlam, who are looking at it, and then the red ones, like uh, like Richmond. Abbotsford, Mission, yeah, Mission Chilliwack, uh, Langley. Langley. Yeah. yeah, and I think they've got to get to yes, because all they're doing by saying no is propping up the black market. Exactly. And those people are going to continue they, to buy stuff from they, the black market. It's just and they've, they've got to get to yes, and they've got to figure out how to do it wisely. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. But if David Eby was sitting here with us, what would be your top couple of things you would tell him that you think, you think he should change uh, or do to move this thing forward? From my perspective, one is the opaque window thing, uh, because I think that's nuts. We don't need cannabis stores to look like they're porn stores or uh, like red hot video stores used to be or uh, an adult store. Well, didn't you know that if you see a plant, some terrible things could happen oh, yeah. to you? Yeah. Well, the one area I'm not sure what it is. Maybe 
do you get addicted if you see the cannabis plant? Oh, yeah. Just, <laughs> I'm not even sure my neighbors would know what a cannabis plant is. <laughs> but the one area where my house I've, where I would grow it is got a sight line to my neighbor's house next to me. And I thought, okay, can't grow it here. But how? But I, I find that one bizarre. But uh, It's totally bizarre. But yet you can probably grow a tobacco plant. Um, but... Uh, I find that the whole thing around the opaque window thing bizarre because, you know, if you're in a store, particularly a woman, you want to see what you're going out to. You want to see what your environment is. Or if you're going into a store, you want to see what you're walking into. And I just find that one is really offensive. That's a provincial thing. I also find that um, from our perspective that the application process is way too lengthy. Uh, We did an application for a client last fall who has multiple liquor licenses and we did an application for him for another liquor license uh, for a liquor primary license and his application was about a three quarters of an inch high we did the application at the same time for him for a cannabis store is 15 inches high with all the documents you have to provide and the uh, we find that and we find that scrutiny really careful but i don't think they're getting to the point where they're going to get rid of the black market they are doing exactly the opposite. They turn people down uh, on security clearances because they fear that they might divert into the black market. You say, well, I thought you were trying to get rid of the black market, so there wouldn't be a black market for them to divert into. But instead, you're going to shove them out so they can compete with you? Is that what you want? Yeah. I mean, it's stupid. You know, the security clearance stuff, I can't believe some of it. I mean. In this, I mean, I know it's bad not just in the cannabis scene nowadays. It doesn't matter whether you've got a criminal record. The issue is, are you in a digital database? You know, and everybody's now in a digital database. So the security clearance stuff I've seen, some of the federal stuff, mostly, is, oh, you were seen at Kitts Beach 10 years ago, and somebody complained about the smell of cannabis. Or you guys were smoking around the car or something. But somebody complained, and they called the cops. The cops came down, took everybody's name. Hey, guys, somebody complained about the smell of cannabis around the car. So move on. Nobody's charged. It would have been better off if they'd been charged. We got to get them an absolute discharge, and they'd have had to wipe it out. Yeah, they wouldn't you have know? their name on record. So I got one. Oh, we think that uh, there's a nexus to organized crime. So we'll say to them, what is it? What are you saying? Oh, we can't tell you. So we'll say, well, you can't tell us. You know, the duty to act fairly requires you to tell us the case against us so we can have a fair opportunity to respond before you prejudice us. That's now a minimum procedural fairness requirement under Section 7 of the Charter. You know, what do you mean you can't tell us? How are you going to determine whether you believe your source, if there is one, when I'm telling you, it's bullshit. It's not true. It's false. So how are you going to, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe this silent, anonymous thing that you're not prepared to disclose to us and call that a fair process in terms of whether I'm going to divert into the black market? What did we do with the Kennedys, the Bronfmans, the Seagrams? Did we go through this process no. or did we roll them all in? They rolled in. We rolled them all in. Yeah, they became I mean, part of it. You give them a license and you say, look, I know you've got a criminal record from before. Or I know you were were in a car where some guy had a joint, your passenger had a joint 20 years ago. Or, you know, you went and you and you went to a Hells Angels uh, racetrack event as a spectator. Or a music festival. And therefore, we think you're associated. You know, this is the kind of crap that I'm seeing. And you say, this is just stupid. You need to say, just like if you're on parole or probation or whatever, if they've got a history, here's your license. We know who you are. We know what you've been up to. This is your second chance. This is your chance to go straight and not compete with us. (laughs) Come on in and let's get going. And and obey and comply and follow the law and you're okay. Exactly. And that's what I have with the Brofmans and all those people. And you know, again, California, it's got some uh, San Francisco, LA, some fantastically progressive approaches being taken by them down there. You know, giving uh, uh, special uh, advanced privileges to say some of the disadvantaged folks who've been more disadvantaged by these laws than others. And, and, you know, the second chance uh, thing is huge in California. And so they're really, uh, I think, you know, we, we have a lot to learn from, from how they're rolling it out. Yeah. So uh, 
No, and up here, we're even finding that people who are illegal in cannabis can't even open a bank account. And um, uh, the, the, the only bank I hear that people are having success with is, Toronto, is uh, Bank of Montreal. Uh, no, but, I think but, some of the others have come around uh, and, uh, and some of the credit unions. But I, I know that was a big problem. Oh, it's a huge and problem. it's still a big problem in the U.S. Yeah. Because and they've got to get it legitimized. I'm surprised Mr. Trudeau hasn't sat down with the uh, uh, presidents of all the various major banks and said, "Come on, guys, it's now yeah. legal. Get on board." Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense for any of the legal licensed producers and so on to have uh, problems like that. Yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. Now, coming back to you, um, you've uh, how much of your practice is devoted to cannabis? Well, I never limited it to cannabis. Um, no, you know, as you I do say, all sorts of other stuff. You do, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, a lot of administrative law. Well, as again, you know, I, I was there when this all started to happen, but I was also uh, in Abbotsford surrounded by federal prisons, and it wasn't long before some of the demands on my time came from people who were, uh, the first one was a guy called Martineau who was busted uh, in the disciplinary court at Matsqui for being two prisoners in one cell. And um, so he came, to, well, I, through a number of sources, I ended up representing him. My first call to the prison was, you know, um, I've been asked to come in and represent this fellow, and they, their attitude then was, we don't allow lawyers in here, which, of course, is the, <laughs> the worst thing you can say to a young lawyer in the 60s and 70s, right? So, but, so they're basically <laughs> saying a prisoner does not have any rights. <laughs> so we took them to the Supreme Court of Canada twice, Martineau and Butters, Martineau number one, Martineau number two, and we established what we talked about a bit earlier, the duty to act fairly, that they have... Every administrator, anybody administrating a statute in Canada who has the power to affect your rights, privileges, or simply your interests has a duty to act fairly, absent an emergency. They have to tell you the case against you in sufficient detail that you have a fair opportunity to respond before they impact you negatively. Uh, and if it's an emergency, they have to do that as soon as possible afterwards. And that's just basic now fundamental stuff. You know, we, I think, started that case in 79 or something, but uh, as I say, in 82, the charter came in and we have Section 7. But uh, one of the biggest f cases that really influenced me was the Steinhauser hostage taking. I don't know if you remember no, that, but in 1975, um, Andy Bruce, Claire Wilson, and Dwight Lucas, an Aboriginal guy, a white guy, and a black guy, took 14 people hostage at the BC Pen and held them in this case management area. Okay, so and they're all prisoners? They're they were all prisoners. Uh, all three of those guys are lifers. Yeah. Um, they had been held in solitary confinement at the pen for over for years. Really? If you uh, read the McCann case, you'll see that people in the cell next door would be complaining about sparrows in their heads, and you'd be saying to yourself, that's going to be me a couple of months from now. They'd kill themselves and the guards would make you go and clean up the blood of the guy in the cell next door. Stuff like that. There's just some horrendous stories about what happened in the penthouse at the old BC pen for, for all these years. And so they started the McCann case, and they were plaintiffs, and they weren't being allowed. They'd been moved out of the hole, but they weren't being allowed to go to the case. And the guards were agitating to put him back in the hole. And so they took these people hostage in a desperate attempt to avoid being put back in the hole and uh, sought a plane ride to Cuba and release of everybody from solitary confinement. And uh, it went on for, I can't remember how many days, but the guards stormed the vault and they shot Mary Steinhauser, who was very sympathetic to the prisoners. Um, Andy Bruce was shot, as I recall, through the cheek Lucas, who was my client, uh, wasn't shot, but uh, anyway, they were all arrested and charged with unlawful confinement and uh, uh, extortion was the other count. And so the trial went on for two months, which was a long day in those days. Uh -huh. uh, we admitted 99% of the case. We said that the evil they committed of taking these hostages was a lesser evil than the evil of putting people in solitary confinement for long periods of time, and that that was cruel and unusual treatment or punishment. But then we only had the Bill of Rights. We didn't have the Charter. 
and the Bill of Rights didn't, wasn't a constitutional document in any event. That's the defense of necessity. And we were showing we were attempting to exhaust peaceful remedies by going to the courts to seek declarations that this was cruel and unusual, but suddenly there was this agitation to put them back in the hole. So anyway, uh, the jury was out for five days and uh, came back and convicted of, I can't remember which count, I think it was the extortion count. Uh, before they could render a verdict on the second count, the Crown jumped up and stayed the proceedings because they were scared silly that that jury was going to make some comment or statement about just what had been going on. So those were the solitary confinement fights. So they wanted to keep but, it, what went on in the, in the BC pen under wraps. Yeah. They didn't want to get out. Yeah. But, you know, we still have solitary confinement problems here in Canada. We've only yeah. just had a couple of recent decisions through civil liberties and so on to, to try and limit and prevent them. We had Ashley Smith kill herself in, in solitary. We, you know, they take people who are who are unstable <laughs> to start off with um, and put them in the hole uh, and leave them there. And, you know, there's mental health issues that they aren't uh, taking into account. Now, you know, I've represented prisoners uh, and for long periods of time in all kinds of situations, whether it's a riot or a hostage taking or whatever, many, many cases. Uh, but I have to say that um, I've also got to know a lot of guards and uh, management. I mean, many of the people who I knew in the early days aren't there anymore, but um, once you have got to really understand the situation, you see that it's dehumanizing to everyone, not just the prisoners. You know, the staff come in and they're told all these stories about all these guys and how dangerous they are and how they might attack them and this and that. And so, especially if, you know, there's a good book uh, Neil McLean wrote called uh, Life 25, One Guard's Story. And, you know, his first day on the job, somebody was killed in the yard. And, you know, so you, you take into account all of those sorts of things that many of them experience. And bear in mind, the same is happening with the prisoners. They're being yeah. told all these things about the guards and about their fellow prisoners. And there are a hierarchy in amongst the prisoners too in, and amongst the staff. <laughs> you put all this together into a prison uh, and it just, as I say, dehumanizes everybody. Yeah. Um, well, we, we, we need to get rid of as much prison as possible. It makes, a, a, it makes us a lesser society. We do not need to contain behind barbed wire people who may be trafficked in cannabis, for yeah. example, no. or heroin for that matter. Yeah. You know, if they are dangerous to the public, fair enough. But there are very few people who fit into that category. I mean, most people, get, you know, people who have been listening to me for years are going to say you're repeating yourself over and over again, Conroy. But as a criminal defense lawyer, mostly, I know, and studies were done by Tony Dube and Julian Roberts way back for the Sentencing Commission, that most members of the public get their information about crime and punishment from a five or 10 second clip on television yeah. or a couple of paragraphs in the newspaper. Yeah. And they think they become experts on it and that they know what's going on and what's fair and what isn't. <laughs> and it's, yeah. it, it's just, you know, it, they, they don't know at all what's going on. And it's very difficult to overcome this gut reaction thing that's got even worse now with Twitter and Facebook, social media. LinkedIn, all that stuff. So, you know, the biggest problem I think we face in the world today is how do we get accurate information to ordinary folks so that they can make informed decisions? <laughs> or, or just be informed. <laughs> just be, be informed. informed. So that, you know, a good decision or a decision that takes everything into account is not just a gut reaction, emotional response to, yeah. to stuff. You know, there's a quote by um, Benjamin Franklin. Um, he once said many years ago, it is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority. And when I look at you, I think that's what you do. You do a great job of questioning authority and questioning why. And so many of us in our society today, we just go along and accept it. Another tax, another fee, another f toll, whatever it is, we just accept it and we just pay it. Uh, we just uh, don't question why we have certain laws or policies, and we find this in the world of liquor. 
the liquor control licensing branch, now the liquor cannabis regulation, brings out a policy, and we just, okay, that's it. But we don't question, why do we have this? Yeah. What's the rationale for it? What's the legal background for it? And what's this really doing to, in terms of who's it protecting? Yeah. And quite often, it's not protecting anybody in society. It's just protecting somebody's economic interests or trying to cut back on workloads. Yeah. Now, in terms of cannabis, coming back to the broad picture, do you see how do you see the role for do you see the federal government getting out of the role of being involved in cannabis and turning everything over to the provinces essentially like that they've done with liquor? But have they done that with liquor? Haven't they kept control over production and things like that with liquor? Not, not on the manufacturing side. They've got it on the taxation side. But, you know, if I want a winery or a brewery or distillery, it's all provincial. Provincial license? I, yeah. And the only so there's thing no need, federal license yeah, to The only thing I need from the feds is an excise tax number. So I pay the taxes. Well, maybe. I, I didn't understand that. And with tobacco, is this the federal license or is uh, it? There's an excise tax on alcohol. It's the same uh, tobacco, thing. yeah. But if you wanted to grow tobacco. That I don't know. I don't know much about tobacco. Yeah. I should check that But if out. you want to make booze, you can make your own booze. Yeah. You just can't sell it, right? Yeah. But the license to, to make it uh, legal production of beer or wine and spirits is that a provincial license? Totally provincial. No the provincial. only thing I need to go and so, get, like we're, we're licensed about four wineries in the Okanagan right now, about three breweries, one out in Port Coquitlam. And, because it uh, used to be federal, right? Yeah, no. It Originally, never, yeah, manufacturing no. or production no, was federal? It was, it was always provincial. Oh, and okay. I, just, I misunderstood that. And then. I kind of wonder if where there's a real role for Health Canada moving forward in this thing now that we've gone to recreational. Yeah. Because everything's going to be recreational, basically. Yeah, there isn't a role for that. Other yeah. than, you know, to some extent, the medical market. People do have to understand that that's a separate yeah. important thing. But even there, uh, most of our health stuff is provincial. Yeah. And so, you know, the province should be involved. I know uh, the model that I think they'd like to see, and I've had people speak to me about this, is where uh, people have got a building where there's doctors and a pharmacy in the same building. And so the doctor can approve somebody for their medical cannabis, and they'll be able to go and pick it up from the pharmacy. You know, that's the sort of more traditional model. That, but, but they need to still focus on that. But I agree completely with you. As far as the recreational market is concerned, alcohol and tobacco are what have led the way. And there's no reason for the feds to remain involved unless it's simply taxation or, yeah. you know. And so, yeah, I mean, why not? The, the provinces are, if the provinces are basically taking over or have taken over long ago in terms of alcohol, you know, it's, it's a, a local thing, yeah. um, as is... Uh, part of the health part yeah. for the medical. Yeah. And we, so, uh, and, and we you know. see and we see differences between provinces and alcohol. For example, our drinking age is 19, Alberta's 18. Yeah. Uh, we see that. Cannabis now in Quebec, I gather, is going We're to 21. 21. Yeah. Uh, okay, and I think Alberta's 18, we're 19. Yeah. Uh, you'll see those differences. It's ridiculous, really. In it is. <laughs> it is ridiculous. <laughs> and I'm hoping over time that they'll even that, that out yeah. and get some greater synergy. But my biggest concern right now is coming back on it is the fact that we got municipalities who are saying no. Yeah. And yeah. my God, there's, they've got to get to yes. It's uh, very they've bizarre. Got to, they've got to figure out a way to get to yes. And we also find in our world that uh, different municipalities have taken up different approaches to how they're going to prove locations for cannabis. Yeah. Um, and Limit some, the numbers. Limit the numbers, where they're going to be located. Put them in a location other than where they already exist. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Like I, I gather <laughs> Delta wants them all in a warehouse area. Well, who wants to go to a warehouse <laughs> area to go buy their cannabis? They should Abbotsford be. It was all on the Green Mile. And now they've come up with all these locations that aren't on the Green Mile. You say, wouldn't it have just been easier to just license them there? Yeah, just license them <laughs> and, and just treat it like uh, like you would a 7-Eleven store ah, or any exactly, other store. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, the most important thing I think we all have to remember is that at least in 1982, we got the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And it applies yeah. to all levels of government, federal, provincial, and local. Yeah. And so while we've got all these politicians that do all these things that uh, are hard sometimes to understand, at least we have some protection there in the charter now that we didn't have before when they go to excesses. You know, Mr. Harper's government violated the charter numerous times. Yeah. I took them to court more than 20 times over international transfers and stuff. 
denying Canadian prisoners a, a right of return to, to come back and serve their sentences in Canada. You know, we've got the public interest. So obviously it, having them come back to Canada where they're going to be released rather than leave them hanging in the States or wherever until the last minute and Mexico then being deported or back, you yeah. know? Public in, protecting the public, you know, it was bizarre. But so we at least know no matter what stripe of government we get in, we have the charter. And I, I have to say that in my maybe biased view, the, the independent courts have done a fantastic job of keeping governments in check uh, using the charter over the last 20 plus years. years. Yeah. Now, the other question I wanted to ask you about people who have got a charge, conviction for possession in the past, is your view that they should be, now that cannabis is legal, they should be, uh, their, their record should be cleaned? Totally expunged, I say. Yeah. What they're doing is, you know, uh, you get a pardon. And at least you don't have to pay the 630 bucks again, which was a Harper government increase from $50, I think it was. Yeah. Um, but remember, what's a pardon? A pardon is we take your criminal record, not what's in the digital database, we take your criminal record and we'll put it in another filing cabinet. And if you screw up, we'll revoke it. So it's simply, you know, it's not expunged. Yeah. It's not gone forever. They say, you know, we did this for uh, the LBTQ community in terms of those offenses that they had, and they eliminated them, and they expunged records because it was a simple thing to do. They're saying it's not that simple with cannabis because it is a statute that has multiple drugs, and they'd have to try and figure out, you know, the possession. And uh, I mean, I don't, don't understand why it's complicated. They're always finding them when they do criminal yeah, record searches. Exactly. So what's the problem? So, you know, yeah, no, no, my view is uh, there's no reason for it, it to simply be a pardon. It should be expunged. It should be gone. And I say every reference to a cannabis, you know, possession or whatever in any of these digital databases should be uh, limited at least so that the only people maybe that have access to them are police intelligence uh, people. Uh, but they're not freely, those database things should not be freely available to the public and shouldn't be used as widely as they're being used to prejudice people and deny them from being yeah. able to do things simply yeah. because of some weird old historical thing. Yeah. Hmm. So. John, I got to tell you, thank you so very much for coming in. Thank you. And I got to tell you, you're, you're a legend in the industry. You've, you've, you're, uh, you're like a Sir Lancelot. You're out there fighting <laughs> the fight. You're a crusader and keep up the good work. Don't well, now we got to fight for these people in the senior citizen long-term care homes. They're going to try and stop us from using cannabis, us old guys, when we get really? in there. That's what I hear. So, I mean, how are they going to do that? We do a lot of liquor licensing <laughs> along in, in, in the <laughs> retirement facilities. But I yeah. heard you have to get a prescription or something even to use it socially, they said, in uh, alcohol in some of the long-term care. Is that so right? the, the nurses keep it. and Locked up? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Uh, that won't work for me. <laughs> I have to go and debate an, el an elder law conference coming up soon, and I have to debate that they should be long-term care seniors should be entitled to use cannabis in their homes and and so it's going to be it's supposed to be like the cbc debate thing and be humorous at the same time so be fun. I'm, I'm putting a, po a powerpoint together of uh, uh, suppositories and all the other uses of <laughs> cannabis <laughs> <laughs> more, more of the edibles and suppositories as opposed to smoking. I think that exactly. Great. I mean, let's face it: smoking and smell have been problems. Yeah, and people have to be considerate of their other people. You know. Yeah. But hey, tinctures and suppositories. Who's gonna? Who's gonna you know? know? And I hear that the salves and stuff that they're making, they can't keep them on the shelves. They're working so well for people. Yeah. And the. The senior citizens is a huge increase in senior citizens and, and getting off all of their other drugs and, and finding it really helpful for sleep. Yeah. So it's going to be very interesting to yeah. see. Yeah. No, I was told I should take it from my sleep because if you want to email at 3 a.m., I'm right there. I'll give it to you <laughs> because I'm a wide awake at 3 a.m. Oh, gosh. And uh, because <laughs> as opposed to anything else. John, thanks very much for coming in Thank and you. being part of License to Chill. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. 
You've been listening to License to Chill with your host, Bert Hick. This podcast is recorded live at Studio 710 in downtown Vancouver and produced by Jade Maple. For more information, check out risingtideconsultants.ca.